Hello? Hello? Uh, yes, uh, yes, 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 yes. Can you hear me? Good afternoon. Well, um,
It is now 1.32 p.m. Um, before I call the meeting back in order officially, I would like to turn to Parliamentarian Dorothea Johnson so that a quorum may be established. Uh, Parliamentarian Johnson? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. I will begin by calling roll with the chair, Chair Moore. Present. Vice Chair Brown. Member Bradford. Member Grills. Member Holder. Here. Member John Sawyer. Present. Member Lewis. Present. Member Tamaki. Here. Member Montgomery Steph. Here. Member Bradford. <laughs> Bradford's here. I don't know if he yeah, heard you. <laughs> I, no, I didn't. I, I did see him though, and I did count him in. Okay. So I don't think he can hear me. Um, I'm going to call Councilwoman Step. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. I can't hear you guys. Okay. Well, well Councilwoman, if you can hear me, uh, uh, President Pro Tem Tony Atkins told me to tell you hi. Thank you. I can hear you. And she says, if I misbehave, let her know. <laughs> All right. And I'm I going to hear you guys. Amos Brown is present. Oh, I know what happened. Vice Chair Brown, thank you. Madam Chair, the task force consists of nine members. Five are needed for a quorum. And there are eight members present. A quorum is established. Thank you. Now that a quorum has been established, this meeting has been officially called back into order. I hope you all had a great break. We'll now turn to agenda item number seven, which is the witness panel number three, recognizing current efforts at reparations. So I am excited to, uh, to introduce the uh, witnesses today. Our first expert witness is Professor Mary Frances Berry. Professor Barry has a distinguished career in public service. From 1980 to 2004, she was a member of the United States Commission on Civil Rights, and from 1993 and 2004, served as the chair. Between 1977 and 1980, Dr. Barry served as the Assistant Secretary for Education in the U.S. Department of Health, Education, and Welfare. She has also served as provost of, Uni of the University of Maryland and chancellor of the University of Colorado at Boulder. In recognition of her scholarship in public service, Professor Barry has received 35 honorary doctoral degrees and many awards, including the NAACP's Roy Wilkins Award, the Rosa Parks Award of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference and the Ebony Magazine Black Achievement Award. Professor Barry teaches the history of American law and the history of law and social policy at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, not sure whose mic is hot, but if it is, may you please mute it. Thank you very much. So our next expert panelist is Deadria Farmer Pellman. Deadria Farmer Pellman is a legal strategist, adjunct law professor, and human rights activist. In 2002, she filed a landmark class action lawsuit for slavery reparations against blue chip corporations. She is credited for popularizing the slavery reparations movement through her groundbreaking research, exposing corporate complicity in slavery. In January of 2000, she exposed and secured an unprecedented public apology from Aetna Incorporated for writing insurance policies on the lives of enslaved Africans with slaveholders as a beneficiaries in the 1800s. Her research linking various blue chip corporations to the slave trade led to them making a $20 million payment to the African American community in 2005. Her litigation strategy in a case filed against slave trade corporations for consumer fraud resulted in the first reparations court victory in American history in 2006. Lastly, we'll hear from Chad Brown. Chad Brown is a native of Jackson, Mississippi, 
now residing in Los Angeles, California. He is a graduate of Tougaloo College and began his professional career with the Atlanta-based municipal bond underwriting, underwriting firm, Jackson Securities, founded by former three-term mayor of Atlanta, Maynard H. Jackson. After 12 years in muni bond finance, Thad changed career paths and entered into digital marketing, advertising, and sales, where he continues to work today. Thad is a reparations advocate, sits on the advisory board of the National Association of Slavery Descendants Los Angeles, and is an active member of the San Fernando Valley chapter of the NAACP. So without further ado, I will turn to Professor Mary Frances Berry. And I'm so honored to have you here. We're honored to have you here, Professor Berry, and you may begin your expert testimony when you're ready. Thank you. Am I muted before I start can. talking? Kamala, can you hear me? I mean, Madam Chair, yeah, you can see me too. Okay. Well, I'm happy uh, that you asked me, although it was very difficult to figure out a schedule where I could be on, um, and I won't take up more time than I'm supposed to, uh, even if it seems that I'm wandering in what I say. I did submit written testimony, uh, and I get to see my good friend, Dr. Amos Brown. <laughs> and uh, it was worth coming on here. I mean, I love reparations. But just to see Amos's face, I haven't seen you, and I don't know when, brother. We're just talking on the phone, and that's it. But anyway, love you, uh, and all the rest of you. And there's Deidre, who I have not seen in a coon's age. And so, uh, uh, in the name of all Black people, in the name of those who I love so much, especially those two, I'm glad to be here. I have a few uh, very brief points to make. Um, and to tell you what's in the written and what I have added, uh, which concerns Cali House and the um, um, ex-slave uh, pension movement. First of all, what I'm about to say uh, comes basically from my own experience from uh, uh, the Cali House book that I wrote, My Face is Black uh, is True, and the research on her, and the book that I am, uh, uh, Forth, is forthcoming from the University of Illinois Press that I did with VP Franklin and the Sundiata Cha Choi, uh, which is on reparations and rep reparative justice. And the rest of it is just whatever comes into my head as I'm talking, but it's important. This is a great subject. I admire all of you uh, for uh, what California has done in sanctioning a task force to figure out whether there should be a study we haven't gotten that far on HR 40 uh, yet, uh, although in some other communities we've done a bit more than that. First point I would make is that reparatory justice reparations have to be have to fit within the internationally recognized principle of morally just acquisitions and transfers, and that must be applied to the conditions of Black folk, uh, African Americans. Uh, in the United States. Uh, and whatever is acquired or transferred uh, must be morally just. Um, and the morally just, reparatory justice requires restitution. That's the first thing. Recognition, restitution for the loss of personhood, property, and lands. And it includes also uh, looking at the damage that's done, which is what you will be doing, I assume, uh, on the inquiry in California, as is done in other places, to people and places in pursuit mainly of financial profit. Uh, state and federal governments, individuals, groups, all can do a work of trying to repair the injustice that has been done but governments have a responsibility where they have condoned, implemented, facilitated, benefited from uh, the injustice that has been done uh, to. It is altogether fitting and proper that the state of California should uh, try to do something <laughs> to remedy the harm that was done to African-Americans uh, there. And maybe uh, it seems like it's taken us a long time to get HR 40 or something passed uh, from the federal government, 
uh, state and local communities and state governments have a responsibility too. I listed in my written testimony some suggestions of things that could be looked at where real harm was done, aside from the usual discussion that we've been making recently about closing the wealth gap, which is important, uh, the asset gap, which, which is all of which is important, but looking at the major pharmaceutical company and how they have profited for the harm that they've done with opioids and other things, uh, and researching that if any study is done, it ought to be uh, that ought to be one of the items uh, that will uh, be uh, looked at. That is looking at big pharma, for example, and trying to figure out, you know, how do we repair some of this harm that's done from people. There's a reparation super fund idea and student loan debt because of the harm uh, that I described the people getting student aid and, and having all those loans and going to institutions that uh, do not educate them and do not provide the benefits that they promise that they are going to give to them with a net loss of what little bit they had before they ever went to take uh, these uh, uh, courses. They have been victimized and students have been victimized by education departments, not only at the national government, but at the state level where they have refused to be uh, exercise due diligence and do what they should do so that these students could not be taken advantage uh, of. It is also the case that institutions, colleges and universities like Georgetown, which famously uh, wouldn't exist if they hadn't sold those slaves in order to get the money to pay for the university to persist, but others that have tried to do something about student fees where they recognize the harm that they, uh, that they have done. Some public universities are trying to figure out how to get uh, reparations funds to take care of the harm. Uh, that in fact, uh, I would think that students in California, uh, universities in California, the state ought to be doing something and that should be one of the subjects uh, that should be there. The other thing is that I often say when I speak at universities in California and colleges, that a lot of people do what free Negroes had to do during slavery which is you pay taxes to support public universities, but your children couldn't go to them. You paid taxes to support public schools, <laughs> but your children couldn't go to them because they were black. Uh, and so here you were paying twice. You've got people, and I've spoken at some of these campuses in universities where their kids can't get into the University of California any place. Uh, or they can't uh, go to any place where it'll do them any good, or if they go to one, they can't get in the programs that they would like to major in uh, because of the number of students that are there. And so they end up going to private, what I call moderately prestigious private universities, where they pay a whole lot in tuition and fees and everything else, but their parents are paying taxes to support the public universities and the public colleges in the state to which uh, other people are able uh, to go. Many of them also in California, and I've talked to lots of people where this is the case, send their children out of state to places. Just like in the old days, the segregation, the states would pay in Alabama, Tennessee, and so on for black folk to go out of state to go to school somewhere where they didn't have something in the state to get rid of them <laughs> because of race. Here we're talking about blacks having to pay twice pay taxes in California, and then send their children out of state to go to school so that they can get a decent education. I think that all of these issues, testing industry, testing industry has done enormous harm to black people. I detail some of it in my paper. I served for a number of years, among all the other things I served at, uh, the advisory board of the Educational Testing Service. And we concluded over and over again that standardized tests should not be used as the only uh, uh, way of figuring out who should be admitted to a particular program or an institution because standardized tests give you some information, but they don't give you the information you need. It is horrible that you have uh, things like happened in uh, San Francisco and in New York uh, City and other places. In Philadelphia, we have the same problem where black kids can't get into uh, elite, even high schools based on this uh, standardized test score, score tyranny 
And it's also the case that many folks can't get into colleges and universities and professional schools, law, medicine, so on. Uh, since Baki, it's even worse, uh, because of standardized uh, test scores. And I have written letters of recommendation for students, white students, black students, Latinos, Asian Americans, who did poorly on standardized tests, but who were very smart and had been in my classes and all that, and gotten them into institutions of higher education where they would not have been admitted based on their test scores. So I think that there ought to be some kind of investigation of all of that uh, too. These are areas that you know, I hope you look at uh, among anything else, if this study gets off the ground, as I hope it will, uh, about reparations. Now, Cali House. The important thing about Cali House and the ex-slave pension movement is not only the details about her being a black woman who had been a slave <laughs> organizing a, a protest and a movement which had according to the federal government that hounded her until they put her in prison uh, for organizing uh, had over 300,000 uh, members who were paid dues the dues were cheap like 25 cents a year <laughs> but they paid them uh, and they were members and they were people who'd been slaves. And she managed to do this with only a grade school education and being a washerwoman and having been a slave, just like a mama was a slave and so on. But the important thing about it is that you can trace the history of the reparations movement in this country for black people all the way back to the ex-slave pension movement and other organizations that less is known, uh, known about uh, that uh, were created during that long period uh, after uh, that, all the way up until the modern uh, civil rights movement. Um, and so people have been trying. And the important thing about uh, Callie House and her movement is that she wanted to get the names of everybody who'd been a slave on a petition, the petitions that they sent to the to Congress. And she said that if we keep these, if we ever get any kind of thing from the government, you can look back there and see who the people were, whose names are there. And when they couldn't write, somebody else would write their name. And if you look at those records, and they're down in the National Archives, and anybody can go look at them, you have the names of people, like you have people who, uh, who and their descendants who are in California, who since I wrote the Cali House book, send me emails and I get all kinds of things from people where they found records and badges in their family from this organization handed down and they didn't know what they were <laughs> until I wrote the book. But the point is that she said, if these people, if we ever get anything, maybe some of these people and their descendants can be involved in some kind of retribution for that. That was important. And the other thing was that they analyzed and proposed actual compensation. It is important to figure out compensation whenever you figure out what harm has been done. One of the things my dear brother Desmond Tutu, who passed recently and I disagree uh, on, and I love Desmond Tutu, uh, we got along, was that uh, you, can ha you can't have reconciliation, in my opinion, <laughs> unless you first have information about what happened then you have people who are sorry for what they did and you figure out a way for them not to do it again and you have compensation if you don't have compensation then you don't get satisfaction which is why the people in south south africa to this day the poor people they're happy to have a country and get rid of apartheid but they're not satisfied because there's been no compensation and the poverty and all the other things that existed still exist so Callie House believed that. She believed also, uh, she believed in mutual assistance, but she knew that mutual assistance by itself would not uh, do the job. So they had a sliding scale of what kind of resources should be given to people, depending how old they were at the time and all the rest of it. The other thing that I would say, and then I'm going to end this here and let anyone who wants to ask me a question uh, ask me one or two, and then I can uh, uh, respond, is that people who argue against reparations today, and there are a lot of them, they even some black folk who come up to me and say, we don't need any reparations. That's asking people for something. We don't need to ask them for anything. 
they remind me of some of my relatives when we were small and we were poor and we hardly had anything to eat. And when they came along with government programs and gave food to people, they wouldn't accept it because they said, we don't want to ask anybody for anything. And I always told my mama, if y'all had taken that food, maybe I would have been six feet tall. And here I am, a little old itty bitty thing. <laughs> and I don't like not being uh, tall. Uh, and because I, you know, I can't see over anything and people push me out of the way. And I got, I said, why didn't you take that food? Well, we don't need to ask anybody for anything. Well, okay. Um, they didn't ask us when they took everything from us. Uh, but anyway, people who argue against it should remember that when Callie House uh, led the uh, uh, pensions demand and went to prison for it in 1917, uh, in 1900, she said, they only 21% of the living African American population, which was about 1.9 million people, had been born in slavery. And if we had given reparations then, which is what they asked for, <laughs> then the problem would have been solved. But oh no, <laughs> did you hear what I said? Only 21%, about 1.9 million people, had been born in slavery. And now we're this far from slavery and we have perpetuated the injustice all these years. And the question is, are we going to intergenerationally just keep on pushing it on down the road, pushing it on down the road? And that's all I have to say. And all of you know more than me because seeing who you are, but I hope that that gives you some help. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Professor Mary, for your incredibly moving and formative expert testimony. So we'll now turn to Deidre Farmer-Pellman. Deidre Farmer-Pellman, you may begin your expert testimony when you're ready. Okay, can you hear me? Can you all hear me? Okay, yes. wonderful. Thank you so much. I, uh, I am uh, grateful for this opportunity to be here. Thank you, Chair Camila Moore and the members of the task force. Um, my name is Deidre farmer Palman. I am executive director of the Restitution Study Group. Uh, I, um, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here also finally speaking with Mary Frances Berry because quietly she has played a major role in our work. So that's all I'm gonna say, <laughs> okay. But, um, <laughs> but uh, as far as um, the Restitution Study Group is concerned, we actually work with quite a number of different organizations. We are an institute that engages in research as well as litigation uh, against companies that are complicit in slavery. At least we have found documentation verifying their complicity in slavery. But some of the other uh, organizations that we work with and kinds of things that we do uh, with them, um, one organization is the New Future Foundation uh, headed up by uh, Dr. DeLois Blakely, Queen Mother Dr. DeLois Blakely. Uh, we are engaged in DNA testing for self-repair. We actually go to Africa, we test Africans, we do DNA tests, and we have created a database where we connect descendants of enslaved Africans with their actual African families. Now, we didn't know this was gonna be possible. We gave it a shot uh, in 2015 and it was effective. Uh, fourth and fifth generation separation, but believe it or not, a lot of us are still in very similar occupations. And when I say occupations, specialties, um, and uh, specialties, that is if you're gifted in, uh, in, in history, uh, uh, singing, orating, uh, your cousin may actually be engaged in very similar work somewhere in Africa. So this is one of the things we do, DNA testing. Uh, a part of that DNA effort is Antoinette Harrell Miller, uh, who heads up a genealogy organization here in the United States. And uh, we call her the peonage detective. Uh, there's documentation online about the peonage research she does, uh, researching families. We're able to do a lot of research connecting families. So that really is, I never thought of that as an issue. We've been doing this research since 2004 when DNA testing became publicly available. Uh, in addition to that, we also, in, the, in addition to her, we also work with uh, Sister Empress Chi, uh, Chi, who is the founder of the Million 
Women March, the one that took place in 1997 out of Philadelphia. We work very closely on the issue of genocide. And in particular, most recently, we issued a, a, an open letter to the president of the United States, who is the person who carried the genocide uh, bill through Congress, which is the law of the land. It's called the Proxmire Act. And we are asking for him to use that law because it addresses many of the issues that, uh, for example, HR 40 would address because quiet as is kept, descendants of enslaved Africans are victims of genocide. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. And that is the injury that we all continue to suffer from in part because we don't, we've been uh, separated from our national and ethnic groups. Uh, and we are subjected to conditions in life that are really destroying our, uh, our survival in whole or in part. And these are issues, these are areas that are covered by the genocide law, the Prosmi Act. Okay, so how did I get involved with all of this? Um, I'm gonna say that I was sort of spiritually drawn to the, the work around reparation. Um, I was uh, uh, actually an activist in the gay and lesbian community where I worked with musicians, women drummers in particular. And I was invited to help with a, a, an event at the African Burial Ground in New York City because I knew a lot of women drummers. Um, what was happening was that a, a burial ground had been unearthed, a burial ground uh, from the, I guess it was from the uh, uh, 1700s, and it was filled with the bones of what they realized were enslaved Africans. Uh, they knew this because some of the burials, uh, some of the remains uh, had uh, teeth, thank you, number one, thank you, dry bones, right. Some of the, uh, some of the uh, 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 enslaved people had teeth carvings. In other words, there were carvings on their teeth that were clearly uh, traced to African tribes, okay? So, um, so this, this burial ground was just outside the wall, Wall Street, and the enslaved people were actually considered the original stock at the stock market, which was an area that was just, just blocks away. They were bought and sold right on the waterfront uh, in, in lower Manhattan. Um, I was invited because I was um, uh, involved with media. I worked in the press office at the Department of Health, just one block away. And uh, it was very convenient for me to walk over. But this image that you see on the screen now is a, a, a photograph taken by Chester Higgins Jr. down in the burial site. I actually saw this live. I was shocked. Uh, if you look at the face of this enslaved person, this skeleton, you see the mouth is open. Now, not all of them look this way, um, but uh, this one in particular, had the mouth open and I was, I, I thought, did they, did, I asked, did they die screaming? And, and I was told, no, um, they, this, the, the bone, uh, the bones opened up when the jaw muscle deteriorated. But I was absolutely horrified. I was haunted. I had to do something and I made a decision that I was going to try to find out, you know, more about what I could do to deal with this issue of reparations. Now, why reparations? When I was a kid, my grandfather used to always talk about the 40 acres and the mule that we were owed. And um, it stayed with me. And uh, I knew that there was something here. And so I applied to law school. And I specifically um, declared that I wanted to be an architect to build the case for reparations. And needless to say, I didn't get accepted to too many law schools, but I certainly got accepted to the one that I needed to go to. And that was New England School of Law in Boston, Massachusetts. that happened to be right next door to Rhode Island, which turned out to be one of the most critical states engaged in the, in the slave trade. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that. Now, um, I, um, so I went to law school and uh, I wanted to know, okay, what is, what is the kind of case I would pursue for reparation? And I thought it was gonna be the government, but after uh, 
learning about, and I was there at a good time because there was a case out of California, Cato v. U.S., where there was a decision uh, that uh, the folks could not sue. There were people that filed pro se, that was on their own behalf without an attorney. Uh, the decision was that they could not, um, they could not move forward with their case because the federal government had not waived its sovereign immunity. So I had to think about what other possible ways one might go about pursuing reparation. And I uh, began to look at private estates and corporations. And the reason why they seem more accessible is because I learned about other arguments that could be made other than, for example, uh, you know, a case against the government. Um, I looked at something in the area of, of equity, the law of equity or the law of restitution. And basically, you know, what I learned is that, you know, if you can make an argument that a party has been unjustly enriched, uh, you might be able to persuade a court to decide in your favor. And so that was the, the theory that I was moving forward with, unjust enrichment. Um, I uh, did this paper and ultimately uh, applied to, um, to an inter for an internship. Actually, I worked with NCOBRA. That was when law students are typically trying to get into law firms, I was looking for the place I could build this case. And, and Cobra, my, my mentor was on, on the panel earlier today, the person that supervised me for a whole summer, Ajwa Ayatoro. Um, spent the whole summer working with her. I studied the 13th Amendment, I think maybe even some 14th Amendment, but mostly 13th Amendment. But we didn't touch on these, this particular theory, but at least they knew my heart was there. I had to wait until I graduated from law school to begin developing the case. And one of the companies that I learned about, and thank you so much for switching the slide, was uh, Aetna, Aetna Life Insurance. As a student, I, I learned that they had written slave policy. So when I graduated, I called them up and I asked them, you know, for copies of slave policies. And in particular, I asked about policies that might've been written on my own ancestors. And they said, well, we don't have any from the state we were from, South Carolina. Uh, but we'll send you what we have, and we'll send you some things on some other companies as well. And so what you have here in figure two is a copy of a slave policy written by Edna in the 19, I guess this was, was this the 50s, I mean the 1850s, excuse me. Uh, but this was written on the life of, an, of, of a group of enslaved Africans, okay? The beneficiary of this policy was the slave owner. Okay, so if you look, you, you, you can see the young ages, you, the 10 year old, there's a 10 year old, there's an 18 year old, a 15 year old, 19 year old, it even lists their occupations, nurse, cook, uh, and so on and so forth. Bottom line is that these policies were written at a time when the transatlantic slave trade had closed. A lot of uh, enslaved people were expensive and, um, and, and a lot of, uh, 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 folks might not have purchased an enslaved African, but for the fact that companies like Aetna, they go ahead and make the purchase. If they die, we have you covered. Now, they didn't cover for the full value of the enslaved person's life. Um, and if, if you can see in those this columns uh, here, you can see the value of the person might be 400, but they're covered for 300. And that was to discourage the slave owner from working the enslaved person to death. Um, but nevertheless, it did happen. Uh, and it ha in fact, it happened in the case of, uh, for example, New York uh, Life Insurance Company. They were called the Nautilus Company. When they were founded, uh, 100, their first 100 policies, uh, one third of them were written on the lives of enslaved Africans. And the first policy that was ever paid out was on the life of an enslaved African, someone who worked in coal mine. And this is one of the things that these policies help make happen. Uh, the employment of these expensive humans, these expensive chattel in ultra hazardous capacities. So one of the things you have to think about, you know, when you see that New York Life Insurance Company commercial is that 
it's the company that made it possible for us to be enslaved in ultra hazardous capacities and they made money off that one third of their first uh investment this is where, where, where the money came from, from enslave, uh, slave policies. Um, well, um, when, I, when I called Edna up, I didn't call up alone. I did reach out to reporters to let them know what was going on. Uh, and that was in part my own insurance, so to speak. Um, I didn't want them to think, you know, I was trying to do anything for myself. I made it very clear to them that I wanted them to create a trust fund that would benefit the descendants of enslaved Africans. I wasn't interested in anything for myself. This was for everyone. And uh, they said they would do something, but when the story hit the media, they changed their mind. And at that point, it became clear that I might have to do more than just call them up and give them a chance to be proactive and do something great. Um, one thing that worked in, out in my favor at that time was that uh, uh, Tom Hayden, uh, a senator from California, learned about Aetna and decided that he was going to, uh, to, uh, to uh, introduce a bill that initially was called the Aetna Bill. Okay, and I think he made that decision very quick. Probably like the story broke in, in, in late February, Black History Month in 2000. And by, by March, he had already introduced the bill. And by the end of September of, of 2000, the bill had passed. It became the first slavery ever disclosure law in the United States. And uh, it required that any company, any, any insurance company doing business in California would have to report on their, uh, their role in slavery. Now, this bill was not just designed for the state of California to be informed, um, but it was designed so that descendants of enslaved Africans could have access to documents that would help us to reconnect with our family. I mean, once again, I mentioned earlier uh, the, uh, the DNA testing that we, uh, that we are engaged in, and that's all part of reversing this thing called genocide, okay? Uh, so these bills were designed to assist in that process so that we can find ourselves, so we can pull our families back together. Uh, so that's, I wanna mention that because I'm gonna talk a little bit more about those bills in a second. Okay, so I'm listing a few of the companies that ultimately we realized we just had to sue. Fleet Boston Financial Corporation today is called Bank of America. Uh, they, they were in the litigation and so were these other companies, but basically there were the banks played a role in, uh, in, in financing uh, slave trading voyages, or they uh, gave loans to slave owners and used enslaved people as collateral. These are some of the circumstances. Uh, the insurance companies, like I said, Edna, New York Life, these are companies that, that uh, played a role in, 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 in financing the enslavement. Lloyds of London, very unique. The Zong case, you're gonna see a little something about that. Uh, comes out of Lloyds of London, uh, uh, companies that were engaged in the same kind of business Lloyds of London is involved in. They finance this transatlantic slave trade, okay? Uh, and uh, the way they worked was that if an, if an enslaved person was sick during the voyage, uh, it, it, the, the policy, the practice was to dump them in the ocean while they're still alive, because if they get to the shore and they die, these companies will not pay the insurance to the folks that, are, uh, that, that own the slave trade voyage. Okay, so Lloyd's of London, that's pretty much what they stand for. There were other companies involved in that. Uh, AIG uh, uh, is another uh, insurance company, Sim similar stuff. Uh, we, these are companies we sued, by the way. CXX Corporation, these railroad companies, they use enslaved Africans to lay the tracks. Those same tracks that we ride on today around the country, enslaved Africans, laid those tracks. They brought in folks from other countries at some point, but enslaved Africans laid those tracks throughout the South and other parts of the country. Uh, the tobacco companies, you know the story, that's a little bit more typical, what we know of planting and, and packing uh, tobacco. So these, these are the kinds of things that, uh, the, the kinds of companies we sued. Now, um, so let me see. Um, 
we can move to the to the next uh, slide. Um, so th the kinds of plaintiffs, is a lot of people talk about uh, slavery as if it's ancient history. What they don't realize, at least th I didn't even realize this, actually, I have to thank uh, someone who um, I haven't spoken to in a long time, and I, I pray that she's still with us, Ina, uh, Ina uh, Daniels Hurdle McGee is her name. This is somebody who I just happened to see after an event who just had a package of information that she wanted to share with me. She loved to meet centenarians and learn their stories. And she wanted to share with me information about people she had met, people who had been enslaved or who were the biological sons and daughters of slaves. And so, you know, I paid attention to her and I tend to pay attention to everybody that brings me anything. So, I'm, you know, you guys pay attention to what my email address is and reach out to me if you have any kind of story. Um, but uh, the first person here, Timothy Hurdle, is actually her uncle. And Timothy and his sister and the brother were plaintiffs in the case, but they are the biological sons and daughters of someone who was enslaved. And so Timothy is holding the picture of his father. Um, Emma Marie Clark was enslaved. She was a plaintiff in the case. Uh, and uh, she, um, gosh, I can't remember her age when she passed away, but she was actually enslaved in the South. And uh, she was discovered on a dairy farm that actually did accommodations, kind of like an Airbnb kind of thing. She was not able to accept the tip, she told them, because she was a slave. And the folks reported it to the FBI, and the FBI actually emancipated Emma Marie Clark, but she was a plaintiff in the case. And we had others. There were other families that were enslaved, one really a large family, maybe eight plaintiffs. And, uh, and there was, uh, they were enslaved until the 1960s. They never knew that Black people were ever free, okay? Um, other biological sons and daughters. And of course, then there were people like me. My, you know, my story is basically my grandfather, who I went to when I was going to develop this case in law school, told me that my, uh, my his his grandparents were enslaved on uh, Saint Helena's Island in South Carolina. We're, we're Gullah people, um, and that they ran away at the beginning of the Civil War. They stole a boat and then they stole their freedom. They they left. They, they it took them two weeks to travel from. St. Helena's Island, where they, uh, I, I'm not sure if it was cotton or rice. I think it might have been rice that they dealt with, but I'm not sure. Um, two weeks to get to Georgetown, where they were able to blend in with folks there. But that's, their, that's the story that my grandfather told me, Clara and Abel Hines. And, and that's the story I worked with. And, uh, what, and, and I mentioned earlier that when I reached out to Edna, I asked him about that. Interestingly, in, by the time we filed the lawsuit, the California Slavery Ever Disclosure report had become public. And uh, it was May of 2002 that it became public. And there was this one record I learned that had not been included in the original report. Um, that one document had to be transcribed and on July Sometime in July of 2002, we got the information. Turns out that the person was named Abe from uh, the same region that my uh, grandfather was from, and uh, I'm sorry, Abel. And uh, and and so, you know, as far as I'm concerned, you know, that was my that was my great 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 grandfather, the person that my my grandfather told me about. First of all, they told me they didn't even have policies in South Carolina, but here you have someone with my ancestor's name in the area of South Carolina. So I, I found that fascinating, but very important because this is the, the point of these slavery era disclosure laws. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit more about those, those laws because they, um, they exist for a reason. Um, well, you know what, before I talk about that, let me just um, mention one other thing about the litigation, our causes of action and uh, what happened in the case. We basically had two types of arguments. We had some historic arguments that essentially were about slavery was a crime against humanity. We, those arguments basically were based on the initial enslavement of our ancestors, although we did talk about the, the harms that we continue to suffer from 
that we, can, we call vestiges of slavery. And that some of the uh, actions uh, uh, and the withholding of documentation about the, the, the role that the companies played in slavery constitute, constitute a continuation or con fraudulent concealment. And the court did not necessarily go with those arguments for everyone, but they did recognize that there were some plaintiffs who had standing, who themselves suffered the injury and were all were close enough to, for example, being the biological sons and daughters of slaves, that they could carry their case forward. And so those cases were allowed to move forward. The next category, uh, the next argument we have were consumer fraud arguments. And those were based on the fact that many of these companies, when confronted uh, with information about uh, their role in slavery, lied. They lied to the public. And, um, you know, it's interesting because there was a, a, a law review article written by Tara Kola Ramchandi, Ramchandani from Harvard University, where she talks about the judicial recognition of harms of slavery, consumer fraud as an alternative to reparations litigation. And basically, what she argues is that if we were able to, to complete our litigation, we would have been successful on the basis of the consumer fraud arguments. And that is because the court actually held that we can move forward without consumer fraud. Okay. I'm getting the Okay. Okay. Are we okay? Should I continue on? Yes, please. Okay. Um, we, that the consumer fraud arguments were good. And so that was the good law. And that is why we say that we had an unprecedented legal victory. You know, no, no, never in the history of our freedom have we had any kind of victory on the issue of, of reparations. And here in the context of consumer fraud, the court said we could move forward. Unfortunately, we ran out of money and we could not pursue those claims, but nevertheless, the precedence is there. And so at this time, we find ourselves with companies who, believe it or not, continue to lie about their role in slavery. And they're doing that in the context of the slavery ever disclosure law. Now, I mentioned those earlier. I talked about California having been the first. In California, you guys, you are the first in so much. Thank God for you. Um, about 14 other slavery ever disclosure laws have been passed around the country, all of them sort of following in the steps of Tom Hayden. Um, they are in municipal governments or they are state governments, just a variety of them. But you happen to have a few really great ones in California. And one that I've been paying attention to is in San Francisco. Uh, and I've been tracking their reports and I have discovered that one company really is very stubborn about telling the truth about their role in slavery. And at this point, I want to give you what I think the Restitution Study Group can help you with. Uh, you need to know who, who should pay. Uh, I don't think it should simply be up to the taxpayers of California. Um, I do believe that these companies that are lying on these slavery era disclosure reports should be held accountable. And um, some of the laws, like the one in San Francisco, does create the opportunity. First of all, these companies can be punished um, based on their profit uh, 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 for how for their lies about their, their role in slavery. But I want to tell you one of the companies, and I'm going to sort of hint at one because we're still doing the research about the, around the other one, but Bank of America, unfortunately, do, they do not want to share the history that they have in slavery. And what's unique about it is uh, that they uh, played a role in slavery, their predecessor company. Um, uh, the bank was called the Providence Bank of Rhode Island. Um, bank of America issued their slavery ever disclosure report. Um, and let me see, I think it was on this, in the 17th, I think, uh, no, 2017, June of 2017. Um, let me see, this may be a little earlier than that, but let me just say this, that the report is part of a 
a, re a, a report that was issued by the clerk for 2017. Bottom line is that they claim to have done research on the Providence Bike of Rhode Island and have found no documentation connecting them to slavery uh, or, or the slave trade. But it is widely known that their bank, Providence Bank of Rhode Island, is a bank that served slave traders. And in fact, slave traders founded the bank. It was founded by John Brown who was a, an advocate for the slave trade. He was like the major spokesperson for slavery in the state of Rhode Island. He founded the bank. He was engaged in slave trading at the time. And so were many of the other uh, uh, shareholders. And the bottom line is that it's very difficult to find the documentation, but we were blessed to have gathered up primary documents for at least 28 voyages. And just for these 28 voyages, the violation of state and federal law should have yielded the current value, $35 billion, okay? This is how much money they should have had to pay. Of course, this is the present value based on the number of slave trading voyages and the number of enslaved Africans. And so just to give you an idea, that's just one example. Another example is a company, as I said, we're still working on the information, but uh, they'll know who they are when they <laughs> hear what I'm saying. Um, they, um, this particular company is associated with Barclays. Now we did research on Barclays and um, we, we initially Barclays Bank uh, did not want to share the truth about their role in slavery. And uh, we, uh, the restitution study group engaged in a, a report, uh, re uh, research to, to issue a report where we found that the bank actually was responsible for 125 slave trade voyages. And in the course of that, uh, of those voyages, something like 38,620 Africans were enslaved, okay? And of that number, 6,045 never made it from Africa to the Americas, okay? They were lost at sea. Now, one of the things I, I mentioned a little earlier was about the Zong, thank you so much, about the Zong case, um, the slave ship murders. And what was happening here once again was that they were dumping them at sea. They didn't think they were gonna make it to shore alive. And this is how they ended up. But we call this, this is straight up genocide right here. Um, you know, and I, I don't know the exact total number of Africans that ended up in the ocean, but there's a substantial, millions of us ended up uh, dead at sea and, and we were dumped alive. And, that, and that's really important to know when you think about these companies that play the role of slavery. So once again, with this uh, Barclays research, you know, there's a major company, probably one of the largest of its type in the world, that's associated with Barclays. And on their report, they did not mention anything about these, this 38,620 uh, enslaved Africans associated with their business. Um, so what I say to, uh, to you all is that please do consider these companies. There are many more. As far as the restitution study group is concerned, we are engaged in, in preparation for litigation against some of these companies, because of course, there are consumer fraud laws that are being violated. We all are relying on these reports to be able to trace our, our, our ancestors. We want to know, you know, who, where did these folks end up? And that brings me to one other issue that comes up a lot. It's very controversial, but I'm going to put it out there. Um, who, who should be compensated? Okay. Now, based on the research that, that we do, the restitution study group, we know that with these companies, especially the ones that engage in the transatlantic slave trade, the people that they enslaved did not all end up in the United States, right? I'll give you an example with, uh, with, Bar with the Barclays research. Of, of that 38,600, just give you some percentages, 
We use the transatlantic slave trade database to gather this information. But we know that 48% of them ended up in Jamaica. Okay, about 8% of them ended up in the United States. Okay, uh, so this is one example. As far as Bank of America is concerned, um, there, the numbers, the, the places that they were dropped off are different. Um, and, uh, but, but one of the things I do want to mention about Bank of America, just I want to put it in the record, they violated U.S. law and, 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 um, and Rhode Island state law. And so they had to engage in dropping enslaved Africans off in foreign countries uh, because Rhode Island did not allow them to engage in the slave trade at all. But the United States government only allowed them to engage in the enslavement of people if they were brought from Africa to the United States, okay? They couldn't do that. So they had to drop them off in other countries. So most of uh, Bank of America, any wealth associated with their slave trading activity would probably show that Africans were mostly dropped off in the Caribbean. But there are some, ind there's indications that many were brought into the South, okay? So I just want to put that out there. With companies, you're going to have situations where money that they owe doesn't necessarily belong exclusively to descendants of enslaved Africans in America. And I, what I re would recommend under those circumstances is definitely still pursue these companies because this is just one example. These are just one example where you have them dropped in different places. Definitely pursue, mm -hmm. but create separate funds that might, that might work for two different groups of people. The alternative Thank is you. only focus on what the uh, descendants of enslaved Africans owe. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. We'll, we'll have some time for questions mm -hmm. um, from the panelists. Uh, from there. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Chad Brown and you may pre present your testimony when you're ready. Thank you, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the task force, DOJ staff, and happy Black History Month. It's a pleasure to see you all again. Thank you for this opportunity to present a report on the modern reparations movement from the point of view of the grassroots activists nationally who came together, engaged in the work, and who have been driving the reparations momentum for several years now. It is an incredible honor to be here today representing the National Assembly of American Slavery Descendants, or NAASD, we are a network of grassroots organizations and affiliates that formed in 2019 for the explicit purpose of advocating for compensatory reparations for black Americans who are descendants of persons enslaved in the United States. Next slide, please. Like others today, in honor of Freedman history, I will begin by showing appreciation to a few notable reparationists who laid the groundwork for our modern movement. In no particular order, these include Reverend Garrison Frazier, Henrietta Wood, Frederick Douglass, Callie DeGuy House, Reverend Isaiah Dickerson, Queen Mother Audley Moore, Father Divine, Malcolm X, Martin Luther King Jr., the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense, Dr. Claude Anderson, Randall Robinson, Johnny Lee Cochran Jr., Charles J. Ogletree, Congressman John Conyers, Dr. William Darity, and A. Kirsten Mullen. Without their selfless contributions and sacrifices, I doubt we would be here today. Next slide, please. On a personal note, I want to wish my grandmother, Bernice Allen Stimley, a happy, early, heavenly birthday today. She was born February 24, 1909, in Meehan Junction, Mississippi, a town you won't find on any map. She was a remarkable woman and a community nurturer. At top right is pictured Stimley Allen Grocery Store that she and my grandfather, Charles, owned and operated for several years in their neighborhood of Georgetown in Jackson, Mississippi. She loved our people dearly and deeply, worked to better her community, and instilled the same ethic in her children and grandchildren. On the left is, 
On the left, she is pictured in her 100th year of life, casting a vote in 2008 for Barack Obama. I saw the joy of someone who was the grandchild of enslaved people, had lived half her life under virulent Jim Crow terrorism, now able to vote for a black president. Next slide, please. The modern day reparations movement can be framed into two distinct phases, each characterized by its unique goals, strategies, leadership, and effectiveness. Here I have bulleted a few distinguishing characteristics and milestones of each phase. As you heard earlier today, phase one of the modern movement, or as I will call it, the legacy phase, saw the founding of the National Coalition for Black Reparations in America in COBRA in 1987. It gained momentum following the 1988 Civil Liberties Act and triumphed with the introduction of Congressman John Conyers, H.R. 40 in 1989. This phase is largely characterized by Pan-African ideology and led by the activists of NCOBRA and its more recently founded partner organization, National African American Reparations Commission, or NARC. This phase gave rise to federal reparations legislation, H.R. 40, and kept the reparations conversation alive. However, the legacy phase of the modern reparations movement unfortunately produced no significant national support for H.R. 40 in its 30 years of legislative life. Phase two, or the contemporary reparations movement, began circa 2016 in the aftermath of the Obama administration and coalesced in online conversations around political education, data, and lineage, which remain core pillars of this phase. The contemporary movement was born out of the Black American grassroots and is led by Black American grassroots organizers and activists who are self-advocating for our shared goals of federal reparations and lineage-based public policy. It's in phase two that organizations such as NAASD and Coalition for a Just and Equitable California, or CJEC, were born. The grassroots advocacy of these and other contemporary reparationist groups is principally responsible for mainstreaming reparations and for moving congressional and public support of H.R. 40 to an all-time high. This contemporary phase of the modern reparations movement is where I am most familiar and is where I will focus today. Next slide, please. The contemporary reparations movement began largely in response to the failure of the Obama administration to produce any tangible results for most of Black America. For eight years, other groups received policy and protections while Black Americans received a consistent diet of symbolism, apathy, and cautious rhetoric. Adding insult to injury, the federal government's response to the extrajudicial murders of Eric Garner, Mike Brown, Tamir Rice, and Laquan McDonald was the Blue Alert Act, which granted more protections to police officers. Contemporary reparations view these years as a failure, one, of both the federal government to specifically address the Black American community's interests, and two, of the Black political apparatus to focus on reparative policy agendas and hold our elected officials accountable to them. Next slide, please. The contemporary reparations movement is also rooted in quantifiable data. A central tenet of contemporary reparationists is that if it can be measured, it can be improved. Grassroots reparations activists across the country are studying, tracking, processing, and advocating for wealth data that uncovers the specific, unique, and urgent economic plight of Black American communities. When reviewing the Obama years through data, we were able to see that the outcomes specifically for Black Americans were disastrous. Between 2008 and 2016, Black American wealth declined sharply as white wealth hit new heights facilitated by government bailouts and financial assistance further exacerbating the lineage wealth gap. In online conversations, everyday Black Americans began to discuss what effective Black politics could and should look like. With burgeoning political education and a lens of data, Black America's decline as a result of government policy became very apparent. Data also revealed the unique nature of Black American divestment compared to other Black groups. With release of the multi-city color of wealth reports in 2016 by Duke University, the New School, and UCLA, 
contemporary reparationists gained access to disaggregated black wealth data. And for the first time, the wide wealth disparities between black Americans who descend from US chattel slavery and more recent black immigrants came into full view. In summary, we learned lineage was the key and that black American politics must be agenda focused and lineage first. Next slide, please. Since formation, it has been NAASD's position that black American descendants of US chattel slavery are the appropriate beneficiary class and that any reparations effort must center the descendant community based on lineage. This is also not a new concept. In his final book, Where Do We Go From Here? Chaos or Community? Dr. King writes, every man must ultimately confront the question, who am I? And seek to answer it honestly. Who are we? We are descendants of slaves. We are the offspring of noble men and women who were kidnapped from their native land and chained in ships like beasts. But we are also American. Abused and scorned though we may be, our destiny is tied up with the destiny of America. In spite of the psychological appeals of identification with Africa, the Negro must face the fact that America is now his home, a home that he helped build through blood, sweat, and tears. That was in 1968. This task force will make history this week when you vote on the question of who should be eligible for reparations in California. Contemporary reparationists believe Dr. Weber was clear, just as Dr. King, Dr. King was clear, in their intent to center lineage in Black American identity and repair. NAASD is confident the task force, after hearing all of the evidence, will make the correct decision. I will also note here that in addition to our recentering Black American identity around descendant lineage, contemporary reparationists have resurfaced and affirmed our long lost political status as American freedmen conferred onto the formerly enslaved in 1865 through Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation and the 13th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. By lineage, we are descendants of slaves. By political status, we are American freedmen. Both are necessary to ultimately reach our goal of reparation. Next slide, please. Also in 1968, in his Two Nations of Black America address, Dr. King provided marching orders to contemporary reparationists. Please play the video. At the very same time that America refused to give the Negro any land, through an act of Congress, our government was giving away millions of acres of land in the West and the Midwest, which meant that it was willing to undergird its white peasants from Europe with an economic floor. But not only did they give the land, they built land-grant colleges with government money to teach them how to farm. Not only that, they provided county agents to further their expertise in farming. Not only that, they provided low interest rates in order that they could mechanize their farms. Not only that, today many of these people are receiving millions of dollars in federal subsidies not to farm, and they are the very people telling the black man that he ought to lift himself by his own bootstraps. And this is what we are faced with, and this is the reality. Now, when we come to Washington, in this campaign, we are coming to get our check. Next slide, please. Driven by political education, rooted in data, and with the urgency of pending economic extinction, Contemporary reparations, reparations activists emerged from the grassroots all across America, committed to completing Dr. King's mission of economic justice. We came together offline, we organized, and we went to work. Next slide, please. As we spread the, the, the lineage reparations message in our communities, the contemporary movement grew from hundreds to thousands to tens of thousands 
and soon to be millions. Next slide, please. Grassroots Black Americans across the country took action and began to self-advocate our collective interests, centering reparations and lineage-specific policy. Next slide, please. We sought out our representatives, both locally and nationally, and demanded their support of, for reparations in exchange for our political and voting capital. Next slide, please. When the COVID-19 pandemic shut down the country in 2020, contemporary reparationists continue to advocate virtually, utilizing technology to communicate and to organize. The pandemic has been a test of the strength and resilience of the contemporary reparations movement, but the grassroots have proven sturdy. Next slide, please. When corporate interests attacked the Civil Rights Act of 1866, seeking to roll back our oldest and most fundamental constitutional protections, it was the grassroots reparations activists that rallied and protested on the steps of the Supreme Court in our collective defense. Next slide, please. Here you can plainly see the impact of the second contemporary phase of the modern reparations movement. Before the emergence of contemporary reparationists, H.R. 40 had not achieved more than 50 co-sponsors in any legislative session. It is the work of grassroots reparationists nationally that should be properly credited for the nearly 200 congressional co-sponsors now attached to the bill. The chart to the right shows the dramatic and correlating increase in internet searches for reparations, which took off circa 2019, again pointing to the powerful impact of the black grassroots. Next slide, please. The grassroots reparations work has been effective, compelling on Juneteenth 2019, for the first time in a decade, a hearing on H.R. 40 by the House Judiciary Subcommittee on the Constitution, Civil Rights, and Civil Liberties. On that day, anyone paying attention could again see the Black grassroots impact throughout the halls of Capitol Hill. The Black American grassroots were clearly demanding to be heard on reparation. Next slide, please. On the subject of H.R. 40, it's important to clarify the position of NAASD and of Black American contemporary reparationists. H.R. 40 is a poorly constructed piece of legislation that has undergone significant revisions in recent years. These revisions threaten its integrity and chances for success. Among its myriad of flaws, stand out the fact that one, HR 40 does not specifically identify eligible recipients for reparation. Two, HR 40 does not speak to direct payments to eligible recipients. Three, HR 40 does not identify closure of the lineage wealth gap as a primary goal of reparations. And four, H.R. 40 does not identify the federal government as the capable and culpable party for reparation. But in addition to those legislative flaws, the April 2021 revision of H.R. 40 removed application of the Federal Advisory Committee Act, the FACA, that ensures transparent deliberations, public meetings, and ongoing public reporting while also maintaining GS-18 equivalent compensation as payments to commission members. That is unacceptable to contemporary reparation. For several years, NAASD and our affiliates supported H.R. 40, but we have also persistently advocated for edits to fix these flaws in order to strengthen the bill's chances of becoming law. Thus far, our calls have gone unanswered. As grassroots Black American reparationists truly and selflessly committed to the goal of reparations, we find ourselves unable to support H.R. 40 any longer. Stated clearly, support of H.R. 40 in its present form is not support of Black American reparations. Our community has been awaiting reparations for more than 150 years, and we deserve strong federal, rep federal leg legislation that has the best chance of success. Next slide, please. Notably, NAASD's position on HR 40 
aligns with leading reparations scholars, Dr. William Sandy Darity and A. Kirsten Mullen, foremost American constitutional scholar and UC Berkeley Law Dean Erwin Chemerinsky, and Mr. John Tatiishi, former director of the successful Japanese American Redress Campaign that produced the Civil Liberties Act of 1988. On an issue as paramount as reparations, it would be foolhardy not to heed expert warnings. I believe everyone on the task force agrees that California is leading the reparations conversation and that what is done here will resonate with the federal government. In that leadership capacity, part of your responsibility is to advocate for federal legislation and a process that mirrors AB 3121, particularly in specificity on eligibility and transparency to the Black, Black American grassroots community. Please be bold in that leadership. Next slide, please. Policy writing is a core component of NAASD's contemporary reparations advocacy, and we have developed a strong alternative bill to H.R. 40 that we are calling H.R. 1865, paying homage to the year of American freedmen emancipation. H.R. 1865 has the support of Dr. William Darity and A. Kirsten Mullen, and NAASD is presently seeking a congressional sponsor to introduce the legislation. In the same way contemporary reparationists uplifted H.R. 40, we will build grassroots support around H.R. 1865, a true reparations bill. In addition to improved federal reparations legislation, in August 2021, NAASD released the Historic Repair Act, which is an acronym from Reconciliation, Equity, Protections, Atonement, Investment, and Remuneration. The Repair Act is a lineage-based policy platform designed to address the deep inequities Black Americans face across all areas of socioeconomic activity. We have shared the Repair Act with various Biden administration staffers, including a domestic policy council, whose feedback was, that it was the most comprehensive policy package they had ever seen from a grassroots advocacy group. Priorities for presidential action, a subset of the Repair Act, consists of 12 legislative memos that can immediately be enacted via presidential executive order. Chief among them are formation of a John Conyers Reparations Commission based on H.R. 1865, creation of a new census designation specifically for Black American U.S. slavery descendants, and reestablishment of a National Freedmen's Bureau. Next slide, please. Specific to California, NAASD, CJEC, and our local affiliates have been advocating around AB 3121 before there was a bill called AB 3121. And when formally introduced in the California State Assembly, members of NAASD Los Angeles and CJEC played a pivotal role in crafting eligibility language that appears in AB 3121 law today, setting it apart from H.R. 40. We worked closely with Dr. Shirley Weber's office, state legislators, and community stakeholders for years to advance, raise awareness, and ultimately pass AB 3121 into law. This hard work was recently recognized with the selection of CJEC as an anchor organization to this task force. Other local legislative efforts of NAASD and CJEC include AB 1604-1604, the Upward Mobility Act of 2022. This bill introduced in the current session of the California State Assembly consists of language that would for the first time ever require all state agencies, boards, and commissions to disaggregate the Black African American category in their data collection and collect data specifically on the Black American descendant community. This is an historic effort, essential to the output and efficacy of this reparations body. NAASD and affiliated grassroots reparationists are pursuing similar data disaggregation efforts in New York, Maryland, and Texas currently. NAASD and CJEC are also rallying support around ACA 3, the California Slavery Abolition Act, a bill that will finally close the abomination of a slavery loophole in the California state constitution, ending involuntary servitude as punishment for crime in the state. NAASD and CJEC are proud to also partner with Mr. Samuel Brown, principal author of ACA 3, 
who crafted the bill's language while serving a 24 year incarceration sentence. If Samuel is watching, welcome home again, brother, and thank you for your work. In 2021, following meetings between NAASD Los Angeles and Mayor Eric Garcetti, Executive Director of the LA Civil Rights Department Capri Maddox and Deputy Mayor Brenda Shockley, the mayor introduced a reparations commission similar to this task force. The LA Commission will serve in an advisory capacity to the mayor, develop a pilot reparations program, and NAASD co-chair KJ Muhammad has been appointed to the commission by Mayor Garcetti. Next slide, please. Here you can see some of NAASD's partner organizations and affiliates who are working in tandem with us to achieve the goal of federal reparations for the descendant community. We are committed to educating and training American freedmen, the Black American descendants of U.S. chattel slavery around civic engagement, political science, nonprofit formation, and policy writing so our people can self-advocate and be successful. Education and training are hallmarks of the contemporary reparations movement. Next slide, please. Finally, last year, I had the honor to interview two living icons of the civil rights movement, Mr. Cortland Cox and Mr. David Dennis Sr., who worked alongside Dr. King, Medgar Evers, Stokely Carmichael, Ella Baker, James Far Farmer, Bayard Rustin, and many other Black American freedom fighters of the 1960s. In conversation with Mr. Cox and Mr. Dennis, they shared the movement ideology that fueled their advocacy and success. Simply, that ideology is that movements are best bottom up, not top down, and movements are fundamentally about people, not organization. That is the same ideology which drives the contemporary phase of the modern reparations movement. And in that spirit, this slide recognizes just a few of the contemporary grassroots organizers and activists who are moving the modern reparations movement forward. Next slide, please. In closing, we descendants of American slaves, the emancipated American freedmen, the builders of this country, the overwhelming black majority in this country are owed a debt of reparations by the US government. We are coming to get our check. All power to the people and reparations by any means necessary. Happy Freedman History Month to the task force. Thank you and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Chad, for your compelling expert testimony. So we'll be continue our ceremonial panel and we have five or so minutes. So excuse the time. Uh, my apologies for that. But thank you again to uh, Mr. Brown, um, to Professor Barry and to um, Ms. Farmer Pillman. So I would like to turn to um, the task force members in the event that there are any comments or questions to our esteemed panelists today. Madam Chair. Brown, you're recognized. I just only wanted to say it's it's a wow, 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 wow moment. And I think that this task was further quantified with specificities, particularly coming initially from Dr. Mary Frances Barry, when she showed us areas where folks have been sneaky and running and trying to hide. When it came to sending black folks out of the state of Mississippi and Alabama to go to the northern schools, that was our money being utilized. When she dealt with this matter of the, the test scores, it made it plain. And even as blind as Ray Charles was, anybody who heard these excellent presentations would leave seeing and understanding. It is time for us to admit, to atone, and to act on an issue mm -hmm. such as this regarding our justified need for the fulfillment of reparations 
black folks with all the hell that we've gone through and still living in, that they so eloquently and responsibly and logically outlined and documented. I'm, 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 I'm fired up and ready to go. After hearing that, it's a reaffirmation of what I've been saying for years. And I want to thank, and I want to thank the staff and the leadership of our task force how we have brought together this quintessential, excellent, dynamite, out of sight, uptight presentation. Even the devil can't get mad over this. <laughs> Amos. <laughs> Thank you, Vice Chair Brown. Uh, I had a question. It's a clarifying question for Ms. Pellman. So in, in your introduction, I read that um, you successfully um, sued on like a slave trade suit and uh, won a $25 million settlement for the African-American community. Could you kind of just elaborate on that or clarify that for me, please? Yeah, let me clarify that. No, without litigation, um, you know, my, one of my attorneys spoke earlier today. Um, 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 gosh, uh, basically in the halls of justice, justice is in the halls. Let me just put it to you that way. Uh, and uh, so the funds that I, that I mentioned um, in, in my bio that you mentioned earlier, actually were paid by companies who had been exposed due to the litigation okay so uh so um bank not not bank of america but jp morgan chase put money out wachovia although they did not they were not part of the litigation they did put out money because they could very well have become part of the litigation they knew that but one company i didn't mention actually it's a university brown university created a $100 million endowment that most folks don't know about, not even the students on the campus right now. A $100 million endowment was created as a result of research that we presented to them. They created their whole task force based on documentation that we provided to them and our request that they do something. So $100 million endowment, still there, okay? Okay, thank you for that. Are there any other comments or questions? Okay, great. Um, well, thank you again to our panelists. Again, uh, Ms. Farmer Pellman, Professor Berry, and uh, Mr. Brown for your compelling testimony. And, and um, thank you all for showing up to this amazing ceremony. We will continue in 15 minutes. Uh, so we'll, we'll break um, from 3 to 3.15, and then we'll continue the ceremony by inviting Professor Stoll from the UC Fund Center, who will then introduce and recognize uh, the anchor organizations through our community engagement.